So what I will I would like to tell you today uh, about is uh, the work we've been doing over the past few years on, uh, on uh, transition metal decalcogenides. Uh, it's, uh, it falls in the, in the, in the class of 2D uh, materials, so, so materials that like graphene can be exfoliated to become perfect 2D crystals. Uh, the people here are people in my group who have been doing the experiments. I'll show you uh, different things. I think the scope of things that you can do is, is quite vast. Uh, you need materials for this work. Uh, uh, Helmut Berger and Enrico Giannini are the people who provide these materials. And we have had uh, different collaborations depending on the specific topic that we've been working on. And so um, uh, these are the kind of different things I'd like to tell you about. Uh, I would first like to tell you about some specific property of these materials in terms of just bare, uh, bare semiconductors. Uh, they are uh, Interesting because they have a good ambipolar transport and that allows you to look at uh, many different uh, effects, both interesting from a fundamental point of view and for device applications. Uh, I will also touch upon a valiol effect, which is very closely related to uh, Leonid's first part of the talk. I'll show you you can induce gate uh, superconductivity uh, electrostatically, uh, starting from an insulator, just by applying a gate voltage. Uh, and if I have time, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how you can use these materials to induce spin orbiting graphene to enhance very strongly spin orbiting graphene due to interfacial interaction, and, and, and then we'll have lunch. And uh, if there is not enough time, I'm afraid we'll have to skip the last point of the, of the, of, of the talk. So, so let me give you a little introduction about these materials. This is a typical, uh, say, crystal structure. There are different crystal structures, but this is the most common crystal structure for many of these transition metal decalcogenides. And um, uh, this, this material has been studied in the bulk for, for a long time and because, because there are many different phenomena that have been observed, uh, like, for instance, superconductivity, charge density waves. They can just be bare metals. Uh, they are semiconductors, semi-metal. And, and even in the bulk, it's uh, totally not exhausted the kind of scope of phenomena that, that, uh, that can be seen depending on the composition because, the, because, the composition, because there are really, really a huge class of materials, about maybe about 70 different. But they have been rediscovered recently because uh, you can exfoliate them and get them to the uh, monolayer level. And, and, and not all the materials are easily stable chemically at the monolayer. So, so uh, initial work has, has focused on these kind of compounds, which are semiconducting, and they are very stable in air. Uh, and one thing that has been noticed uh, uh, in the early days, which is a few years ago, uh, is that um, uh, if you take a, a bulk uh, I say a piece of bulk of these semiconductors is an indirect gap uh, material, but if you exfoliate down to the monolayer, uh, the gap becomes direct, and you observe that, and people have observed that by looking at the uh, uh, quantum yield of photoluminescence, which, which explodes exponentially as you, uh, as you lower the thickness. Uh, so this is, for instance, the photoluminescence on a single layer, and in absolute scale, this is the, the, the bilayer. So if you zoom in, you still see photoluminescence, photoluminescence but on a linear scale, is, is almost not detectable. And this is confirmed by, by band structure calculation, which shows that the bulk is an indirect gap. And as you lower the thickness and you go to the monolayer, uh, you, end up, uh, you end up with a direct gap. And so, um, so this is, this is, this will, these are the ex experiments which trigger the, the interest in these materials. And the reason why, why, why um, they are particularly interesting, especially coming from uh, many years of work on graphene, is because a monolayer is an hexagon. Uh, um, and so as a... As a um, uh, say valleys at the K and K point, uh, and uh, and uh, contrary to graphene, this valley because there is a, uh, there is no inversion asymmetry, these valleys are gapped. Also, there is a, a huge spin orbit interaction. So this is shown here: the, the the red and the blue are different spin direction oriented perpendicular to the plane. Uh, and as you go from from the K point to the minus K point, because of Kramer's degeneracy, the spin uh, direction is inverted. So you basically have only close to the to the to, to this K point. You have that an effect in Hamiltonian that describes the system correctly is basically a, 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 a gapped uh, Dirac fermions uh, with a strong spin orbit interaction, meaning that the gap depends on the spin direction. Is uh, just like as Leonid has explained, then you can have among other things uh, a lot of phenomena which are interesting, which come from the fact that, that the electrons here have a, a finite barrier curvature, which means that basically you have uh, they, they, there is a whole conductivity associated to a valley. Uh, and, and, and say the annoying thing, if you wish, is the opposite valley, and the annoying for an experimentalist at least, is that the opposite valley has an opposite uh, hole conductivity. So if you just measure the whole effect at zero field, you see nothing because you see compensating effect. And so, and so it will be interesting to see what you can do and, and, and to, 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 to reveal this effect. And one thing you can do is, and I will come back more in detail, is you, you can exploit, uh, exploit um, uh, selection rules in optical transition. Which, only, which you can uh, use to only couple to one of the valleys, and therefore to, to generate a valley imbalance and, 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 and break this compensation between the two valleys. 
So uh, one technique that we will use quite a bit is, is uh, in part of the talk is uh, ionic liquid gating, and which is a, which is a way to, um, to accumulate a very large charge density uh, on top of uh, different materials by gating. And it's essentially, instead of using a, a solid dielectric, uh, you use a liquid made of charged particles. These are pretty large molecules, say one, one, micron, uh, one, mil, one nanometer in size, uh, which electrostatically is basically like a, me a metal, meaning that there's a very short screening length of, say, about one nanometer. And so when you apply a gate voltage in the liquid, uh, the, the voltage drop at the interface between the metal and the liquid, uh, there is no actual voltage drop across the liquid, and so it will all drop across, uh, the, the, the voltage will all drop across the, the gate uh, and the liquid, and then between the liquid and your semiconductor. If you do things properly, it will basically all drop across uh, the liquid and the semiconductor, which is a way to have a huge capacitance because then you have a capacitor with a, with a dielectric which has a thickness of one nanometer. And you can accumulate charge density up to a few times and then to the uh, 10 to the 14 per square centimeter that you could never do with conventional uh, dielectrics. So, so, um, so this, is, this is just a technical point, but it's an important one. So uh, let's first look at the basic semiconducting property of this system, and we'll focus on tanks and disulfide, but if you use a, di a different one of these semiconductors, it will basically be the same. So the first thing you see is this, this possibility to have a very large charge density accumulation. You, we sweep the gate voltage, and so this is an example of a device. You put a, your, your ion liquid on top, you stick a wire in it, and then you, you sweep the gate voltage, and you see that you can, uh, with a fairly moderate gate voltage, so a few volts, you go to, uh, you can accumulate a large amount of electrons, and up here you are clo close to 10 to the 14, or of holes. So on the same system, you can just, by switching the gate voltage in the lab, you can go from large hole density to large electron density. Uh, in uh, transistors, if you look at, the, um, at the, what is called the subtracer swing, which is this quantity, um, normally uh, there is an intrinsic limit. Essentially, this is coming from how, how steep this can be. It's coming from the fact that the finite temperature, the, the Fermi Dirac distribution has a, has a, uh, has a finite width. Uh, and in the best case, if the gate capacitance is huge, which is what, what would be the case here, you find that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that the, say, the steepest value you can have for this, uh, for, this, uh, for this slope is given by this number. And if you actually use these uh, ionic gate transistors on these materials, you get exactly that number. That means that this capacitance is basically really, really large. It's, it's not a conventional transistor, it's, it's a con trans or it's a conventional transistor in which the gate capacitance is, you can take it in a first approximation to be infinite, if you want. Um, so let's see. Uh, one consequence of this is that you can already use these devices, because you see uh, holes and, and electrons, to, uh, to, to measure the gap. And the idea is very simple to the band gap. The idea is very simple. You can sweep the gate voltage, and, and when you sweep the gate voltage, this causes typically a shift in Fermi energy and a shift in electrostatic potential. Uh, and and, uh, and the, the electrostatic potential is you can, in a parallel plate capacitor, is just the, 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 the charge by the, uh, by the density divided by, by, the, by the capacitance. But if you're in the gap, the density of state is very, very small, so you accumulate very small amount of charge, and the capacitance is very big, so this term you can forget. And so the, the, if, you, if you compare the, 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 gate val <coughs> the gate voltage value when you are starting to, so the threshold for hole conduction and threshold for electron conduction, this is just exactly equal to the gap. And in fact, if you do that, you find that for bulk uh, tanks and disulfate, you find that the, the gap, the, the, this difference in threshold voltage is 1.4 uh, eV, which is exactly what the gap is known to be in tanks and disulfate. Turns out that this technique uh, uh, works for even for devices which are not as, uh, uh, as ideal as this one, just because the capacitance is always very large of the ionic liquid gate. And it's actually very convenient because now you can uh, use it, for instance, to measure gaps in semiconductors, which are very, very small flakes, which should not be easy to measure with other experimental techniques. So uh, since you, you are able to, to, to see ambipolar transport, another thing you can, you can do is uh, uh, try to, to see if you can uh, basically inject electron and salt at the same time and, and get light out. And, uh, and so these are the typical curve of a transistor. You see the typical saturation on, on the, when you accumulate electrons, or I think actually holes here when you accumulate electrons. They all look normal, except that when you go to large drain voltages, you see this upturn that you normally don't see in transistors. And if you look at uh, like, you know, the typical book, like the book on, on, on semiconductors, you typically do not see this curve. So, this curve only happens at as a large source drain voltage because that means that locally, what is happening here is that locally on one of the contact, you are inverting the uh, effective uh, potential of the, of the channel. And that means that, that uh, you are injecting on one side one polarity of, of, of one, uh, say charge carrier of one polarity, and the opposite side 
charge, uh, charge current of the opposite polarity. Um, so the, the way you can think about it, you can think that you set the gate to zero and you go very large uh, uh, with the potential on opposite uh, contact on opposite polarities, and that, that means that locally the potential of the, of the channel is different and you have different kind of charge carriers. So if you, if you do that and you send current, uh, you have electrons and, and, and holes coming together and then they recombine and they should emit light. Well, they should emit light if the semiconductor is a direct gap semiconductor, otherwise there will be, uh, things will be dominated by, by non-radiative recombination. So in the bulk, the gap is indirect and in DDR we don't see light. But if you go to the monolayer level, uh, then the gap is direct and we should see light. And again, we can do all the, all the same business here. We can measure our nice and bipolar transport. We can extract the gap find that it is much larger, as you expect for the monolayer. It's instead of 1.4, it's 2.2 EV. Um, and, and again, you see this ambipolar injection regime where a high source strain bias, uh, the, the, the current shoots up. And now the question is whether when, when, we, when we bias the device in this regime, whether we see light or not. And, and the answer is yes, we do. So this, this, you can see it with your bare eyes under a microscope, basically. And this is the red spot here. Uh, it's just light coming out of the device. Um, you can compare the spectrum, so the, the, the frequency dependence of the light that is emitted with the one with the light that is emitted not by electrical injection but by illuminating the device with a high energy light and see at the light which comes out which is photoluminescence and they basically perfectly match so this is a this is a and, and, and what this is is a recombination of excitons uh, and in fact since we, we are able to to measure the band gap and we are able to measure the uh, exciton energy we can get the axion binding energy uh, just by directly from the measurements, which in this, in, for these devices is about uh, 200 millivolt. Uh, theoretically, it's predicted to be even, I mean, there is a spread of experimental value. Theoretically, it's expected to be even larger than that. 200 millivolt is already pretty large. So this is to show that this, 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 uh, this system in terms of optical electronics have quite a bit of potential. They're allowed to do things which are not easy to do with other semiconductors because they are ambipolar. Uh, and and, uh, and there, is, there are other things which are interesting which you can do when you combine optics and transport, and one is the valuable effect. And since uh, Leonid has discussed this already, I will go fast, but, uh, but the idea comes basically from graphene and, in fact, from gut graphene. Uh, and just like uh, Leonid has said, there is, a, there is a finite Berry curvature, and that means that each value has a, a whole conductivity which is equal and opposite, so under equilibrium you see zero all voltage, but if you would be able to, um, to, to unbalance the population of the two values, the contribution to the whole effect, uh, of, the, of, of the total contribution to the whole effect would not, would not cancel, uh, and you'd, you'd see a finite whole voltage at zero, uh, at zero magnetic field, if you are in this situation. So the question is how can you do that? And, uh, and the same people who, who did this work, they also predicted that uh, uh, one way to achieve this situation is to pump the system with a circularly polarized light because there are selection rules uh, that tells that, uh, that uh, if, you, um, if you have, uh, say, one, say, uh, one circular polarization, you can, you can only couple to one value, and the opposite circular polarization couples to the opposite values. Therefore, if you shine, uh, shine light with this light, you will, according to this theory, uh, excite uh, electrons from the valence to the conduction band, uh, and, uh, and of course, this electron can relax, but under st stationary condition, you will have a different pop population uh, of, the, of the two values. So they predicted by... By, by measuring the whole effect at zero magnetic field under circular polarized light, you would see a whole voltage, which is a manifestation of the, of the, of the Berry curvature uh, in, the, in the two valleys. Uh, and in graphene, it's not, okay, as, as Leonid has shown, it's, it's, it's possible to see effects related to this with different techniques, um, but not so easily with light because the gap is small. And, and, and so in the, instead, in these materials, the gap is, is uh, uh, 2EV. And so you can do it with visible light, which has, a short wa uh, which has a short wavelength, so you can make a small device. And in fact, last year, this, has been re uh, this phenomenon has been observed by uh, Mac in McEwen's group. Uh, so what, what you see here is a piece of molybdenum disulfide, another one of these semiconductors. Again, they are conceptually very similar, uh, in which they send current. And under circular polarized light, they measure the whole voltage. And they see that indeed there is a whole voltage when light is circularly polarized. And if, it, if, they, if they change the polarization, the whole voltage change sign. And if they use linearly polarized light, there is no whole voltage. And, uh, and they interpret this, this phenomenon in this term in terms of single particle picture. But actually, there is a little problem with that because uh, they shine light at 1.9 EV. And 1.9 EV in molybdenum disulfide is exactly the exciton energy. And the exciton binding energy is large. So we certainly don't have... Um, interband transition at that energy. And so the question is, how is it possible to get uh, a whole voltage 
from exciting exciton, which are neutral particles, and they have no charge. So even if you would accumulate the exciton on one side of your device, um, it would not be possible. I mean, they, being neutral, they would not generate a voltage. So we have been looking at this problem in tanks and disulfide and made a very similar device at first, in which, um, again, we see the same phenomenon. If we, if we look at, uh, if we have, uh, if we illuminate the device with a uh, circular polarized light, we see a whole voltage, we change sign depending on the polarization and disappears when we have a linearly polarized voltage. And the whole voltage, which is a black line here, so the whole resistance, uh, is speaking exactly at the same position as the photoluminescence, which is the exciton energy. There is a second, a second exciton here that you don't see in photoluminescence, but let's focus on this. And, and, and this energy is, again, quite a bit smaller than the, than the back band gap in tanks and disulfide. So, so how does that work? Um, uh, to, to understand what is happening, I mean, we, we, went, we went back to look at other phenomena which, which have, say, a similar problem, and one of them is, is photocurrent. In photocurrent as well, you can uh, illuminate your device, and you see that the announcement of the photocurrent, you see up here in photocurrent, at the exciton uh, energy, which again is strange because you generate an exciton which are neutral, and so why should they give any photocurrent at all? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and turns out that in this case, though, the answer is known because people have studied photocurrent much more, and essentially, if you have a device uh, like this, whether you see this photocurrent or not depends on the position of your laser beam. So if you put your laser beam in the center, you don't see anything uh, because what you do, you generate exciton that they diffuse and they recombine before anything can happen. But if you put, if you put the, your laser beam close to one of the contacts, uh, what happens is that you generate an exciton, this diffuses, and if it diffuses towards the contact, it will be split in the electric field associated to the Schottky barrier the minority carrier will escape into the contact and the majority current will stay into the semiconductor uh, and we create a, a, a valley imbalance uh, population of charge carriers. Uh, and, so, and so in fact, if you now put your laser beam close to the other contact, you see the same effect but with the opposite polarity because the same charge carriers escape in the other contact, so opposite current. Uh, so this is telling us that if we are able to map, uh, by, so in photocurrent, this phenomenon is very clearly visible by doing a spatial mapping of the signal, and so we do the same thing for the valley hold effect. Uh, and and uh, so basically, we fix our light at the frequency of the exciton, so be well below the interband transitions. We uh, apply a current and measure the valley hold effect and fix the bias here, where we see a valley hold effect, and then use a device like this and scan the laser beam across and see how this voltage that we measure depends on the position of the laser. And the result is shown here where we see that the, we actually see value effects only when the laser beam is quite close to the, to the contact. So what, that, what is happening is, again, you generate electrons, uh, excitons. These excitons diffuse. If your laser beam is here, they will recombine and nothing happens. But if, it is clo if they are close to the source contact, where you also put your, 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 your hole probes, they, they will reach the, 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 the contacts, they will split in the, the axon will split into the electric field, and the majority carriers will go back and give you a valley polarized distribution, which is why you see uh, a whole signal. And that's the, the signature of this phenomenon is the fact that the, 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 the magnitude of the signal becomes larger the closer is your, your laser beam is to the contact. You, you could think, okay, why doesn't it happen in the other contact? Well, because here you also split your excitons, but uh, the, the particle will lose its, this, this distance too far is beyond the intervalley scattering length, and so you don't have valley polarization reaching the region in between the contacts. So, so this part, uh, this, this basically shows that uh, uh, by mapping the value effect at different frequency, you can, you, can dis you can tell something about the origin of the process which give, which give rise to uh, this whole voltage. Let me move on to uh, another part of the, of the talk, which is how we can still use exactly the same materials, which are semiconductors, now to turn them into, a semiconductor, into superconductors by accumulating enough charge. And a, and a breakthrough work here is done by, it was done in the group of uh, Yoshi Vaz a couple of years ago, who took basically thick uh, layers of molybdenum disulfides, basically bulk, uh, and by using a gate voltage, he was able to turn them from an insulator, so undoped semiconductor, or, or maybe slightly doped semiconductor due to impurities, and accumulating charge at the surface, then he was able to see a, a, to see a, a transition to a superconducting state uh, with a maximum transition temperature of, uh, of uh, 12 Kelvin. And uh, he discussed this in the context of superconductivity uh, seen by intercalation, which in the same material was, was also seen earlier, uh, which I think is, is a bit more uh, questionable. But, but the observation of superconductivity with gate voltage starting from an insulator is really an impressive result. So we are interested in this and see also how, how this varies when you go to the atomic, uh, 
uh, when, you, when you bring the material to atomic thicknesses, and we've been doing experiments uh, to, to, to do this. So what you see here is a, is a device, again, on which we put a ionic liquid. This is a six-layer molybdenum disulfide. Uh, and you see that with applying gate voltage, we are able to see a superconducting transition. However, what we find in basically all our devices, there tend to be quite a bit in homogeneities because, well, for technical reasons related to the, to, to the property of the ionic liquid, still the maximum TC that we see is always is pretty comparable to what uh, Yoshi Vasa saw in his thick crystal. So, so six layers is basically, uh, is basically um, bulk. And if you look at the critical speed, actually this is impressively large. It's 10, close to 10 Tesla already. Um, and and um, I think Yoshi has recently done, for, for thick sample, uh, has measured the critical field in the plane, and it's immense. It can reach up to 80 Tesla or something. So, um, so we were interested in going to, 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 to smaller thickness, and so in particular to the monolayer. And if you go to the monolayer, well, again, you see superconductivity, but now TC is quite a bit lower. And also the, the critical field is much smaller. Um, and so basically in the monolayer, you also see superconductivity, but it is much less robust. You don't see it in all the samples, and, uh, and when you don't see it, you, you, you can see phenomena like weak anti-localization, which, which, uh, which come from the fact that, that you have a strong spin order interaction. So what about thicker layers, like bilayer, trilayer? Well, as soon as you go to the bilayer, it resembles much more the bulk in the sense that the, 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 we always see superconductivity. Uh, the transition is more robust, uh, and TC is already quite a bit larger. So, Whereas you go from 1.5 Kelvin or close to two to, to basically almost seven in the bilayer, and if you enlarge your critical field from 0.1 to uh, two, three Tesla. Uh, and if you go three layer, four layers, you, you basically get superconductivity robustly with, with TC, which seems to, to depend on thickness and become slowly higher and reaching the bulk value. So it's interesting to compare all these thicknesses and see what happens. So this is, this is basically putting together the measurements of the, of the critical temperature versus, uh, versus thickness and critical magnetic field. And you see that basically there is, uh, and again, because of the inhomogeneity, you have to do quite some statistics, which we have done a bit of. And what it looks like is that you have a trend with TC and the magnetic field. Now, this is log scale, so the effect is less pronounced. But decreasing, uh, as you decrease the number of layers, uh, fairly smoothly. And then going from the bilayer to the monolayer, there is a much steeper drop. Um, and this, okay, we are not, since we have charge density homogeneity, it's difficult to tell what is the density dependence, but, but this doesn't seem to depend on density dependence. The density dependence is kind of a measure from whole effect, is a bit all over the place, uh, and TC does not depend too much on that, as long as it's high enough. If you don't put an high enough density, you don't see superconductivity. So why is that? Why could uh, the, the TC be, be much smaller in monolayers compared to thicker layers? Uh, well, there are different reasons. One, of course, there will be, uh, there, there, there could be, I mean, if you, have, if you have the accumulation length or the accumulation thickness of the electron layer that you, do, that you, that you put with the gate uh, as a certain thickness which determines by screening. And, and it turns out that this thickness is about 1.5 nanometer. And the monolayer is the first layer in which this, that has a thickness which is really thinner than this 1.5 nanometer. Two nanometer, which is the, the bilayer already has, has, a, has a thickness comparable to the, uh, to the screening length, which means that you'll be able, so, so it could be the superconductivity is suppressed if you, if you try, if you go below this uh, screening length. But what we think the most likely explanation is, is that if you look at the band structure, in the monolayer you accumulate electrons at the K point, whereas in bilayers and thicker layers, according to calculation, you should be accumulating electrons uh, at a different part of the Brillouin, in a different part of the Brillouin zone, because it's an indirect gap, and, and, and essentially you accumulate electrons here, which is, which is called the Q point. So then it's not so strange that, uh, that superconductivity is different, because the density of state will be different, and the electron phonon coupling will be different. In fact, it's, if you want, it's strange that you see superconductivity for all thicknesses, because in principle, these materials are all different. So they all have different uh, electron phonon coupling and different density of state. So there is no guarantee that if you see superconductivity for the bulk, you should see superconductivity for the bilayer or the monolayer a priori. And uh, how much time? All right. So let me go very fast to the last topic, which is how we use these materials to induce uh, spin orbit interaction in, in graphene. This is a work we did also in collaboration with the group of Alan McDonald for, for theoretical calculation. And, and there, is, there are clear reasons why you'd be interested to try to induce spin orbit interaction in graphene, because we know from the work of Kane and Milley that uh, uh, if you take pristine graphene and if you, if you consider the effect of spin orbit interaction, in principle, conceptually, this material is a topological insulator, a gap opens. 
But of course, in graphene, it's by now known that this spin orbital interaction is way too small to see this, this topologically insulating state experimentally. Nevertheless, it would be interesting to find a way to amplify spin orbital interaction much more uh, to try to, to be able to see this state. Uh, and there have been attempts. Attempts typically have put graphene on metals because there are metals, I don't know, like platinum or, or with very large atomic number. Uh, and they, with this, in this case, you can induce very strong spin orbital interaction in graphene, but the electronic state of graphene hybridizes so much with the metal that, that you lose completely the Dirac fermion character of the, of the electrons in those cases. Um, you can also induce spin orbital interaction by creating <coughs> impurities of certain types. Uh, and again, that works up to, up to a certain extent, but, but again, you damage graphene and, and, and you, you, you decrease the quality. So what we want to do is to try to, to induce spin orbital interaction but preserve the quality of graphene. And what we do, we put graphene, which in this scheme is the black layer, on top of a tungsten disulfide, uh, thin crystals, and then on top of, a, of basically a gate. So this is a conducting layer with, a, with an insulator. And let's not go to the details, but, uh, but basically on these kind of devices, we still see perfect quantum all effect, exactly as you expect for Dirac fermions in graphene. Um, and, and this is a first generation of device with mobility, which are okay, like 13,000, but by now we are able to get basically one order of magnitude bigger, so we have these kind of devices with mobility which are 100,000 or, or, or bigger. And then what do you see in transport? So we use weak anti-localization to detect uh, spin orbital interaction, and so if you measure the conductance as a function of magnetic field and gate voltage, well, in these devices, which are actually pretty small, uh, you see it's difficult to, you, you might see a hint of something here at zero magnetic field, but, but UCF, universal conductance fluctuation, are too big, and you don't really see uh, a clear weak anti localization. What you can do is an ensemble averaging by changing your gate voltage by as little as possible, but enough to, to, to sort of change the microscopic character of the device, or of the sample, and then average of the, of the traces. And so here you see one trace, which is one cut here, then if you average nine of these traces, you get the red one, and if you average 25 traces, you start to see that something emerge at small magnetic field. And at the same time, the, 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 universe, the, the, UCF, the, amplitude, the root mean square of the UCF decreases like the square root of the number of averages. So, so this is what you're doing. These, these are basically reproducible uh, things. Uh, and so if we have done this for different gate voltage ranges, and you see a very nice uh, Weak anti-localization signal, which increases as you lower the temperature, and that the lowest temperature is, compiled, is, is, is a large fraction of the square over H. Uh, we can fit this data with a theory of uh, uh, Edward McCann and our chairman, and extract basically the spin orbit uh, relaxation time, the spin relaxation time. If we do that, we find that the spin relaxation time, which are these black dots, are say 100 to uh, say 100 or more <laughs> times more shorter than, than, than the spin relaxation time for graphene on silicon oxide and boron nitride, meaning that spin orbit interaction is much, much stronger. And in fact, it's comparable to the uh, interval scattering time on, that, that people have measured on a bunch of different subsets. These, these are data points from different groups on different materials, so it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, and, and so these, these measurements by themselves show that spin orbit has been, uh, has been uh, increased a lot just by putting graphene on, on, on tanks and disulfide. Uh, and the fact that the interval scattering time might be playing a role in relaxing spin could also explain why neither the diakonov Corel nor the elliott yapet mechanism have been, have been found to really account for spin relaxation in graphene. But this we are, we, we are not able to tell. So weak anti-localization does not tell us what is the kind of uh, or the functional dependence of the spin orbit that we are inducing. And, and uh, Alan McDonald and his postdoc at Watch N have done uh, a initial calculation to try to figure out what, according to theory, we should expect. And what we should expect is, 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 is uh, well described by a, con close to the Dirac point, is well described by a continuum Hamiltonian given by this expression. So the, the, the dots here are a result from a initial calculation and the, and the red lines have fits uh, to the dispersion relation obtained by this Hamiltonian with these parameters. And they find that that this coupling depends on the distance between graphene and, uh, and tungsten disulfide. And basically, for reasonable value, experimental values, or by using codes that allow to relax this di distance, they find that these numbers are a few millivolts. So compared to what you have in pristine graphene, which is uh, 20 to 50 microvolts, we are talking about a 200, 200 magnitude increase in spin orbit interaction. Now, these terms are not the don't have the same functional dependence that you would have in pristine graphene. Um, because they are violating inversion symmetry, so in pristine graphene that would not be possible, but when you have graphene on a subset, that is possible. Um, 
And depending on the, on the relative value, so if you would have this lambda is, is bigger than lambda r, r, then you would open a gap, and this would be a topological insulator, although not of the time predicted by Kane and Milley. Um, so I guess the next step is to decrease this order and increase this, 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 this coefficient even more experimentally to try to see whether we can get ourselves into the regime where, because now we have a few millivolts spin out the interaction, a few, millivol few millivolt gap, which is small, but is not unthinkable small in terms of, of being able to put your Fermi level in there and try to, and try to see uh, edge states uh, if this is topologically really. So with this, I would like to conclude. Um, and uh, so here is my summary. That's the topic I've been telling you about. So thank you for your attention.